Hi folks, this is Dave Reed, the host of the Mondo Weiss podcast. Before we get started with today's episode, I wanted to let you know that our fall fundraising campaign is underway and generous supporters have agreed to match your donations. Mondo Weiss is a reader and listener-funded nonprofit news publication. This gives us the independence to report on events in Palestine accurately and comprehensively because we answer to you, our readers and listeners. In the past three years, we've invested pretty heavily to grow our team of reporters and contributors. We now have four full-time staff in Palestine, five full-time staff in the United States, and many regular contributors all over the world. And I'll be honest, growing a nonprofit news organization in today's media landscape is a pretty risky move. But we believe the movement for Palestinian liberation is in a transformative moment. And we believe that Mondo Weiss plays a critical role in centering Palestinian and anti-Zionist voices. That's why we've taken this risk to grow our staff in these uncertain times, and it's why we need your support. Please visit our website at mondoweiss.net to learn more about our fundraising campaign and chip in. Your contribution will be matched, doubling your impact. Thanks so much. Now, on to today's show. Welcome to the Mondo Weiss Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Reed. At Mondo Weiss, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. The Canadian group Independent Jewish Voices Today is releasing a report titled Unveiling the Chilly Climate, the Suppression of Speech on Palestine in Canada. Researchers Cheryl Nestle and Rowan Gaudet spent the last year gathering information and testimonials about the repression faced by academics, students, and Palestine solidarity activists across Canada. This is the first study to use ethnographic methodology and qualitative analysis to describe both the overarching effects of this repression as well as the deeply personal impact it has on activists, artists, students, and professors. While many people active in the Palestine Solidarity Movement are familiar with the tactics described in the report, it is shocking to read the dozens of testimonials collected and understand the extent and scope of the suppression efforts. I spoke to Cheryl and Rowan last week about the report and what can be done to counter these attacks. So Rowan and Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Our pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. At the beginning of your report, you describe, quote, a wave of suppression of speech regarding Palestine across North America and Europe, and you link that to the efforts of pro-Israel organizations to promote the acceptance and formal recognition of the definition of anti-Semitism developed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IHRA. We've covered the IHRA definition extensively at Mondo Weiss. For those that are not familiar with it, can you explain what this document is? how it's being used by pro-Israel and, honestly, anti-Palestinian groups to try and shape the discourse around Israel and its treatment of Palestinians. Certainly. So the IHRA uh, working definition of anti-Semitism is honestly a somewhat um, bland working definition. It has this core definition that is um, very oddly written, includes, and I quote, a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews, um, and kind of walks around the issue without simply saying that it's a form of hatred or a form of racism. Um, and maybe more importantly, for our purposes, it also comes along with 11 examples, seven of which uh, discuss the state of Israel, rather. Um, and so this definition really puts this focus around anti-Semitism back around Israel, rather than focusing on Jews as the victims of anti-Semitism. Um, and so it does this with different examples, such as claiming that the state of Israel is a racist endeavor or having double standards towards Israel that you wouldn't hold to another nation. Things like that are seen as anti-Semitic under this definition. But it's all very broad in that there's no real cutoff point where it says, well, this, you know, you can, it says you can be critical of Israel without being anti-Semitic, but it doesn't really say what that means. And so it's kind of very, it catches everything and can be used in any way. Um, because it never draws those limits of, well, this isn't anti-Semitism and this is legitimate criticism of Israel. It just says that somewhere out there, there is this legitimate criticism. And so how it's been used has been as this blanket document, which can be twisted and has a lot of institutional backing because mm -hmm. a number, uh, dozens of nation states and other kind of international actors have adopted or voiced support for this definition. 
And it kind of brings this discourse uh, of something called the new anti-Semitism into this formalized and institutionally backed um, field. A new anti-Semitism in, in kind of really short definition is essentially to the claim that um, Israel is now the recipient of uh, anti-Semitism. And so anti-Israel action is also anti-Semitic in of itself. And it's been used in quite a few cases, um, such as here in Canada, Faisal Baba, uh, who was an academic who uh, was smeared, uh, Akili Membe in Germany, who's a famous post-colonial scholar. And really to, in these specific cases, which often get quite a bit of media attention, but also it creates this chill, this this fear to, mm -hmm. to speak out uh, in support of Palestine or Palestinian human rights. And part of that is because it's so vague and so people can't really look at it and say, well, how can I you know, express my critique in a way that fits perfectly within this definition? Because there's no real clarity gained by it. It's actually just serves to, to silence as much as possible. Efforts to suppress pro-Palestine or anti-occupation speech is a longstanding element of pro-Israel groups' work. What makes you describe the current period as a wave of suppression? I think there, there are several elements to this wave. Um, first, we're seeing the IHRA being pushed much more vigorously. Like very recently, we're seeing mm -hmm. these pushes. Um, in 2022, 22 uh, U.S. states adopted the IHRA. Um, mm -hmm. Just in 2022. So that's pretty extraordinary. Or something resembling it. It isn't, you know, always strictly the IHRA. It's something that acts as the IHRA would act. Um, and in many of these places, and this is true in Canada as well, um, these measures were adopted um, by declaration rather than by any democratic process. We've certainly seen that in Canada where, for example, in Ontario where I live, there was a, a bill being proposed in the provincial legislature that would implement you know, install the IHRA. Um, and there was tremendous opposition to it. And the bill was passed in something called order and by something called order in council um, the day before the debates, the, the public debates were to begin. So when we just saw this happen in Alberta, another province as well, and also in British Columbia. So I think there's a heightened awareness on the other side that there is significant opposition to this. Uh, and therefore, they are resorting to undemocratic measures to uh, install the IHRA in these, you know, public institutions of various sorts. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, we're also seeing a very concerted effort on the part of the pro-Zionist organizations to convince the the public that the universities are hotbeds of anti-Semitism. Right. Um, <clears throat> and this is very interesting because. There's actually very little empirical evidence that this is the case. And in some ways, I think a report um, shows that what's happening to advocates for Palestine is much more um, systematic and, and much more serious than what's happening to Jewish students. And I don't suggest we need to discount accusations of anti-Semitism that Jewish students or faculty may be bringing um, but I think that we need to examine them closely. They need to be taken seriously. But they don't compare in any way, shape, or form with this very systematic um, and, dare I say it, well-funded effort to suppress speech uh, on Palestine on campus. Um, you know, through, I mean, it, it, we outlined in our report how many of these organizations like Hillel, so in my province, they have a $4 million budget they have professionals that that you know advise students how to counter, um, you know, Israel criticism on campus, etc. Um, so this is a very you know well organized um, effort, and that's not happening. That's not true on the other side at all. The other thing that I think we're seeing is the targeting of the equity, diversity, and inclusion um, offices on campus um, with accusations that they are not taking Jewish students and claims of anti-Semitism seriously. Um, and I think a lot of them are being lobbied very vigorously by the pro-Israel um, lobby in Canada, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is rather worrisome um, because I think that, that there are elements to the exclusion of, of Jews and anti-Semitism from, like, EDI um, 
concerns and discourse that need to be corrected, but not if it's being, um, you know, uh, framed as anything that's anti-Israel or critical of Israel is anti-Semitism. Therefore, that's what you need to go after. Um, yeah. Um, and one more thing I just wanted to say about that is that, um, you know, we had a, a case here in, in Canada uh, of the University of Toronto um, uh, being involved in a hiring scandal um, involving um, a pro-Palestine legal scholar. Um, mm-hmm. There was direct intervention by the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs into that hiring. It became an international incident. Um, the university was censured by the um the uh, Canadian Association of University Teachers, and that was an international censure. Um, so, you know, we see that kind of thing, had that kind of bold-faced intervention and suppression, attempts to suppress. And of course, you, you know, just to touch briefly on, on Europe, what's happened in Germany and the UK, with the UK, you know, demanding that all universities bring in the IHRA. Um, and in Germany, where the anti-BDS legislation was passed and and so many um, there have been many many cases and legal battles uh, in the in Germany and in the UK um, over expressions of criticism of Israel. So we it's it's just it's like piling up one on top of the other and it's gotten really it's gotten really intense. I would say your report examines the so-called chilling effect that suppression of pro-Palestine speech has on the discourse. How does this chilling effect manifest for different groups of people, such as activists, academics, and so forth? Because you break them out in your report. Yeah, I mean, we already know from the public incidents of harassment and and intimidation um, and legal cases that racialized individuals and pro-Palestine individuals who who are uh, racialized scholars and activists have borne the brunt of these attacks. Um, mm-hmm. That's really, really clear. Um, and also, when you look at the attacks on Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib, and, and um, you know, those have been particularly vicious and racist. Um, and then you have people like Angela Davis and Cornell West and Mark Lamont Hill in the States, um, all racialized scholars who have been attacked, you know, viciously for their pro-Palestine statements. Um, but of course, Palestinian scholars and activists have really um, taken, you know, the worst hits around this. So you've got, you know, it, it goes back a bit, but the cases around um, Joseph Mossad and um, Nadia mm-hmm. Abu El Hajj, whose tenure mm-hmm. bids were were attacked, and luckily they managed to overcome that. Um, and you've got, but you've got the the incessant attacks against um, Rabab Abu Hadi at, at San Francisco State. Um, which just don't seem to let up. And of course you've got, and that's been carried out by the Lawfare Project, which is a pro-Zionist group, which uh, uses legal strategies to try and shut down speech on Palestine. And then of course you have Stephen Salida, who lost his job at uh, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana for, you know, tweets that he made during the 2014 Gaza uh, war. Um, you know, so you've got, and then, you know, uh, Rowan mentioned uh, the Cameroonian historian Ashil Mbembe and his being disinvited from uh, a talk in, in Germany uh, mm-hmm. after his writing was re- revealed, and people know this, uh, as comparing uh, apartheid in South Africa to the Holocaust. Um, and that was, they claimed that, that rendered him unsuitable to, to give this speech. Um, and then you've got Canary Mission. I'm just, you know, back to the idea of racialized um, faculty and Palestinian, Arab and Muslim faculty and students getting targeted. So if you look, you know, it, it's it's pretty obvious if you go look at the Canary Mission website, which is used to dox and embarrass and out Palestine solidarity activists, that certainly among students, the vast majority of students there are racialized students or visibly Muslim students, hijabi women in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's always a preponderance of racialized individuals, although there are a really significant number of Jews among the faculty um, on Canary Mission. So, uh, you know, they, they go after anybody they possibly can. 
Um, yeah, and in our report, just to get back to our report for a second, um, this is this, this our report bears this out as well. So you have, you know, the the Palestinian students and scholars were the most targeted. Um, they uh, articulated the most emotional um, distress over the kinds of experiences that they've had, um, including threats of sexual violence, homophobic and Islamic mm-hmm. content in these threats. Um, and, and basically they, they got the, the full force of, of the um, pro-Israel uh, lobby on campus. You write about the weaponizing of the label anti-Semitism. This is something Mondo Weiss has covered really since uh, the publication was founded. It came up again for us in a big way recently when we interviewed Maloon Qatari, a member of the UN Commission of Inquiry tasked with identifying the uh, root causes of the violence between Israelis and Palestinians. In our interview, which you can hear in episode 39 of the podcast, he was describing a seemingly concerted effort to undermine the work of the commission funded by pro-Israel groups, many of which are Jewish in nature and identity. And he was roundly denounced as an anti-Semite for it. The attacks came from as high as the U.S. State Department. We issued a statement making clear that these attacks were intentionally misrepresenting what he said. But underneath that noise was a truth that there is a concerted effort to undermine the commission's work and is being funded by pro-Israel groups. Your report makes note of this and describes in great detail the sources of funding for efforts like this in Canada. You mentioned Hillel and some other groups. Can you talk about the groups behind these efforts and some especially important events or elements that have helped drive this wave of suppressed speech? So I I think an ecosystem of sorts exists among the Canadian groups which play play various roles in mainstreaming accusations of anti-Semitism. And I intentionally use the word ecosystem ecosystem because I don't think and I don't want to use a word that implies some sort of grand orchestrated scheme. And when you watch these groups, it's quite clear that they're not often working together. They're, they actually butt heads quite often. Um, but that said, while these groups often don't work together super well, they do often play specific roles. And so one example is Canary Mission, which Cheryl already mentioned, which kind of hosts these um, um, profiles of various activists and uh, academics. And essentially, it makes it so that when you Google someone, the first thing that comes up is this profile, which claims that they're an anti-Semite, which claims that they support terrorism, etc. And them, as well as a group called Honest Reporting Canada, which kind of gets its uh, members or the people who follow them to bombard newsrooms across the country whenever they, you know, deviate from the kind of pro-Israeli line and to send these newsrooms complaints and to to spread accusations of anti-Semitism. Groups like this kind of cast this big net and they kind of try to cover as many bases as possible and, and to make sure as many people as possible or newsrooms as possible or activists as possible feel a bit of this burn and a bit of this pressure. And of course, for every person that actually faces this pressure pressure or gets a canary mission profile there's you know five friends or colleagues who are fearful that they themselves will get it as well um on the other hand there's also a lot of political organizations which uh, do a lot of lobbying around adoption of the IHRA and also kind of work on big cases that come up, such as the, you know, the University of Toronto scandal that Cheryl had mentioned. And so we see groups like B'nai B'rith Canada, Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, CJA, the Canada-Israel-Jewish Alliance, which Cheryl already mentioned. Um, and they claim to, depending on which group it is, either speak on behalf of Canadian Jews or to speak from human rights background. Um, and do a lot of lobbying around pushing for the IHRA or even just this kind of backlash of making sure that things get into the media with um, press releases. And within these groups, you'll see kind of differences in the language that they use. Some of them will use more intense language. Some of them are more diplomatic. And there's kind of variations in how they do it. And then in the more extreme example, you have a group like the Jewish Defense League, which is a Kahanis, so so far-right Jewish group. Yeah. Um, which recently disbanded, although its members are kind of, in Canada at least, recently disbanded, and its members are kind of looking at forming new groups. Um, But they will go to protests, they will use physical violence, they will also just put kind of ridiculous smears online, um, kind of vague death threats to make sure that people are scared and things like that. And so these are kind of a variety of tactics and 
you know, often when something kind of blows up and activists are suddenly facing a lot of pressure and getting their names in the media in a way that maybe they don't want, there'll be a combination of these these uh, groups coming after them and not necessarily in a coordinated effort, but they kind of all just go for this, um, for this, um, yeah, for this attack. And mm-hmm. so this, yeah, ecosystem, <laughs> I'm calling it, is is really the basis of this push and simultaneously continues to push the IHRA on various levels in the kind of longer term beyond any one uh, event or one um, uh, occasion for backlash. And this is all kind of taking place within a broader, even international um, context, which sees you know, Israel's shift within the past 10 years to really targeting the BDS movement and, and the kind mm-hmm. of diaspora. Um, uh, and so you see with this, there's also um, this push for for new anti-Semitism discourse, which is kind of the broader international context for what we're seeing in Canada. And within Canada specifically, it's quite interesting in how it's kind of started to overlap and contradict with changes in perceptions of racism and colonialism here, as we see things like Black Lives Matter taking off and changing conversations, as well as the various indigenous uh protests going on and taking um really kind of forcing the media to reckon the mainstream media to reckon with uh legacies of colonialism and racism here these pro-israel groups are often kind of working with that and often adopting progressive language um such as you know claims that jews are indigenous to israel etc yes or discourses around anti-semitism is the other obvious one where you know kind of forcing um their way into uh, these conversations around racism and anti-racism, which is a place where anti-Semitism should be discussed, of course, but really doing this in order to kind of undercut efforts to also discuss anti-Palestinian racism and to also mm-hmm. discuss Israel's ongoing apartheid uh, in Palestine. And we see these kind of things overlap in ways, especially when you start to see kind of the more conservative backlash and the anti so-called critical race theory thing and all these ideologies coming together in ways that that overlap often uh, and often this comes into conversations around anti-semitism as well um where anti-semitism is pitted against critical race theory um and so you know critical race theory it's is said to exclude jews and thus you know anti-semitism versus that a very harmful narrative if I can throw something else in here to the mix, um, one of the things that I've been noticing very recently is the the that organizations like Hillel, which I think previously had a sort of an almost a neutral image as being just support for Jewish students on campus, are now partnering with the further right wing organizations like Stand With Us and um, Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center here in Canada, which is you know, really one of the most right-wing and most egregious of the organizations that deploy tactics of of suppression and intimidation. Um, And they are banding together and there's no, you know, I I think that their politics are starting to blend. Like we're seeing the real face of Hillel and some of these things coming out um, when we see who they're beginning to partner with. Um, And I think that's a worrisome um, Move. The other thing that I wanted to add to what Rowan was saying was that um, one of the things we've seen here are, as in the States as well, um, are legal challenges. So B'nai B'rith is really litigious, and they've tried to sue a whole bunch of Palestine solidarity activists, and they have not been successful yet, um, which is good. But they have no qualms about going after whoever um, with allegations of anti-Semitism or human rights violations, etc. So, you know, it's like it's coming <laughs> from all sides here. Is that a new development in Canada? You mentioned the lawfare uh, group here in the United States. That's been something that's been, you know, going on in the United States for quite a while with organization behind it. Is that new to Canada? Uh, I think it's relatively new. It's the last few years that that's been happening. And there is... You know, the, the far right in Canada, the far Jewish right in Canada, represented by groups, and they're very tiny groups, uh, like the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Um, they are 
partnered with the most right wing groups in the states, including Lawfare, um, Stand with Us, et cetera, et cetera. So they're learning that you can import this into Canada and and do this uh, to Canadian Palestine solidarity activists. Um, but as we've seen, they're not enjoying very much success with this strategy, um, mm. which is good. But they do take their lessons from across, you know, from across the border, for sure. Your report also looks at the real world impact of these efforts to suppress pro-Palestine speech, it includes testimonials uh, from people that have been directly affected. Can you tell us about some of the stories that you collected that illustrate uh, sort of the baseline? normative effect of these efforts? What's the typical experience for people that are being targeted in this way? Yeah, so uh, my side of things in the way we kind of divvied up the research was looking, I was looking more at the students overall. And, and, I, and I think some of the things that you saw that were really typical were administrative administrative uh, barriers. So one student reported um, several days before a, a panel was to take place. This was before COVID, so an in-person panel. Um, the university suddenly decided that they needed security and that security was going to cost this student group $3,000 um, and essentially said, you know, if you can't pay up, then you have to cancel the event. And likewise, m- many activists reported talking, um, you know, whenever they wanted to book a space on campus, if they had to go through the university administration, they would uh, get one of their ally groups to do it instead of, you know, Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights being on the ticket. It's um public interest research group. And so, you know, this other group who doesn't have Palestine in the name would essentially book the space for them. Um, There's also stories of admin kind of calling in university students for one-on-one conversations, uh, quite often racialized university students uh, and and female um, racialized university students, and kind of Mm -hmm. condescendingly warning them about the impacts that this could have on their future. and this this is all kind of par for the course. Things that were were not unusual. Um, likewise, uh, people talked about having their Canary Mission profiles brought up. Uh, one student talked about uh, a potential landlord when they were looking for an apartment just after graduation, asking them, you know, what's all this stuff about terrorism when I Google you, oh, um, and wow. things like that. Um, or, or people getting calls at their employment or their workplace because uh, activists were kind of getting into the media and suddenly people went, oh, I know where that person works. And so this this workplace, which was a student job, it wasn't anything, you know, it was kind of like a side gig. It wasn't anything related to Palestine. Suddenly started getting these calls about this anti-Semite yeah. that worked with them. Um, and, you know, I think these are all quite normal. Students reported, and I, I know professors also reported similar things about being fearful or even if they're going to do it, nervous about bringing up Palestine in class or with peers, whether those peers be fellow professors or fellow students. Um, there are entire Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights chapters on campuses in Canada that simply keep their members anonymous. So even when you know a member writes an op-ed, they write it as member of SBHR at whatever university. Uh, and that's that's a safety mechanism, which seems kind of ironic for a university where people are, you know, starting to write and starting to, to publish, that they have to do it all anonymously and essentially keep mm-hmm. this hidden. Um, Cheryl already mentioned the, the threats of violence, as well as just, I think, an incredible amount of anti-Palestinian racism that was faced on campus, especially from students and often overlapping with or, or uh, alongside Islamophobia. Um, but I think it's quite normal for for Palestinian women to uh, report that they saw, you know, the kind of comments of like, oh, what, you know, the things you would face there and these kind of comments about Islamophobic uh, or sorry, Islamophobic comments regarding women's treatment in Palestine. And, you know, it's Mm -hmm. someone who's not Palestinian kind of mansplaining this to them in this uh, Islamophobic and anti-Palestinian racist trope. Uh, And these were all quite normal um, you know, I, I think as one person put it, they they kind of start talking about one Palestinian person, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the quote in front of me, they kind of start talking about you in this derogatory manner, and then they realize you're Palestinian, and it just kind of allows them to to back up all their claims even further, you know, oh, well, right. they're Palestinian, and thus they have links to terrorism, et cetera. Um, and I, I think in concluding from from my side of things, at least, 
the the repeated use of the terrorist label, especially to anyone that was racialized, and especially among them, Palestinians was something that just came up over and over again. And I'll I'll take it up from the faculty side. Um, and I I when I think about this, I there are I think four things that that concern me: um, interference into hiring um, procedures. Um, interference into knowledge production in general, surveillance of faculty, um, and the emotional consequences of harassment. So, um, you know, we one of the things that we saw um, from our transcripts was several people reporting interference into hiring, where anybody who was identified as either Palestinian or pro-Palestine um, was, uh, you know, thought to be predisposed to discriminating against students who with whom they did not agree. Um, the candidates were seen as potentially divisive for the departments that they were being hired in, and Jewish faculty organizing to say that these candidates um, were, uh, you know, that they would feel unsafe in the presence of these candidates. Um, yeah, the, um, you know, the, the intention, somebody said to us, the intention was clear uh, and the inference of anti-Semitism was made very clear. In other words, anybody who was pro-Palestine was um, characterized as being anti-Semitic, divisive, um, you know, a threat to Jews in the department. Um, people were told to avoid any reference to Palestine in their interviews, for example. So even if their area of work wasn't Palestine and they were asked, Oh, can you talk about classroom, you know, controversy and how do you settle that? And of course, that's a very good topic to talk about if you're going to talk about that. Um, but people were warned, do not use that example because you don't want to go near that topic at all. Um, a lot of the, one of the things that we found that's very interesting is that some of the people who were most affected by this, um, is, were the, uh, were pre-tenure or faculty or faculty or, or people who are looking for jobs for, for academic jobs. Um, so one of, you know, one of the uh, interviewees commented that, you know, he said the toughest part was making 130 job applications and not knowing if the reason you're not getting anything is because of how bad the job market is, your publication record um, or Palestine. So, you know, not really being able to, to you know, to put their finger on right. why they might not have gotten interviews or jobs. Um, the, the, the um, you know, the efforts to suppress knowledge about Palestine in so many ways is extremely disturbing in an academic environment. Just recently, the last couple of weeks, um, people at the University of Toronto announced um, two new courses on Palestine. Uh, in an effort to get um, students to to enroll, um, they were attacked again. I was saying that that there is an alliance between Hillel and some of the more right wing organizations. There was a a statement put out, you know, condemning these courses as being exclusionary around Israel, um, and there was fear that they would be, you know, attacked or that people would disrupt uh, the start of the semester. Luckily, this did not happen. But the you know the audacity of saying you cannot teach this topic um, is quite remarkable coming from you know Jewish community organizations saying you may not teach this topic. Um, the other thing, is, uh, several people reported us to us that academic articles that they had written um, were conveniently lost. <laughs> Um, if they were about Palestine, rejected. Wow. Um, we have a nice little um, screenshot of of a of a um, of a research um, application that was submitted for funding from the federal government um, that said that this is biased. Were it was about Palestine, this is biased. It cannot be allowed to uh, to be funded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and a lot of people, and this is to me very sad talked about how they would have liked to have written about Palestine or devoted their academic career to Palestine, but were told you will never succeed, you will never advance, you will never get hired if you do this. So people actually pivoted, or in, in the case of Canada, went to Europe, where it has been easier to write about Palestine, strangely. Um, surveillance, 
really concerns me. Um, this is something that several of the faculty reported that in their classes, they will have pro-Israel students who not only challenge them in the classroom, but report them to administration if they perceive something is anti-Semitic in, cl- in the classroom, including mm-hmm. teaching things like settler colonialism, right? And some of the, even mm-hmm. some of the canonical yeah. texts of settler colonialism studies um, have been targeted as anti-Semitic by students who are performing this role of surveilling um, pro-Palestine professors in the classroom. Um, and that's pretty when you, scary. When you say these these canonical texts, are you saying texts that, that are used in the study of uh, in, in that field, but that don't necessarily even mention Israel-Palestine? No, 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 they do. They do. Okay. But I'm saying that these are well-accepted, you know, academic right. texts that a lot of people who teach this topic use. So these aren't like crazy, you know, far left radical screeds. I mean, these are academic, solid academic works yeah. that are recognized as authoritative. So, you know, even even those kinds of things, um, you know, are targeted by students doing the surveillance as anti-Semitic and reported to administrators. And then in several cases, the faculty had to answer to the administration on the content of their classes um, that included this material. So that's censorship of the worst kind um, and very scary in an environment that is supposed to be opening up knowledge um, to people. And just the last thing I want to target here is the emotional impact on faculty of this, which um, some of the quotes that we've gotten are just, they're heartbreaking, actually. Um, you know, people saying, I, I, a Palestinian professor saying, I, I felt completely ill at ease in my workplace. I could never talk about myself personally because to talk about myself personally is to talk about Palestine. So I knew that I couldn't do that, and I just shut up about myself, which I think is very damaging and, and, and you know, it has a certain violent character to it. Um, people said things like this, and I just want to read this quote because it's so affecting. Um, it says, the emotional impact I feel that I am like kind of like a bacteria. I don't really know how else to describe it. I feel like I am this dirty existence, like I'm a dirty word. I have a dirty identity. And if I talk about it, it ruins everything. Like it ruins the department, it ruins their PR, and it ruins the university. So in Mm -hmm. terms of talking about Palestine, it's, it's, it's just, you know. And then somebody else said, emotionally, it's a daily trauma waking up in a society where the dominant narrative erases you and recognizes your colonizer as the legitimate owner of your land. That you're stereotyped as a terrorist instead of a victim. That teaching about it becomes akin to a battle that you might lose any time. And it goes on and on. I mean, there are many, many more quotes like that. Um, and they're heartbreaking. And you, I mean, and this is just, these were Palestinian faculty talking, but then you, you also have Jewish faculty saying, it, you know, that the, the, the attacks had damaged her professional reputation, shattered her emotionally, and left her feeling insecure with past co- colleagues. She felt humiliated and ashamed. Those are some That's of the most egregious things. It's horrible. Yeah. Uh, particularly, you know, for, for Palestinians in this situation, it, it, it's as if their very existence is being called anti-Semitic. The, the, the very existence of them as as a human being is 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 evidence of of some kind of anti-semitic conspiracy i think you're very you're very right there yeah yeah in some past episodes of our podcast we've talked about how the traditional arguments that the israeli government and pro-israel or anti-palestinian groups deploy to defend or justify israel's actions are just not having the same effect in policing the discourse that they once did I, I sort of think of this from my days as a poli sci student uh, as roughly equivalent to the so called soft power tools like arts and culture interventions, public narrative building, et cetera. As those options narrow or collapse, pro Israel groups and individuals turn to tactics roughly equivalent to so called hard power, using institutional or even state power to simply stifle criticism or action. You've discussed several examples of this already. So we get the IHRA definition and we get an organized and funded effort to get institutions and even governments to adopt and enforce it. I'm curious what you think about that and what you believe is driving this wave of suppression efforts in contrast 
to that in years past? What makes this different from previous efforts, if you think it's different at all? I think there are so many cracks in the Zionist wall, so to speak, at this point, that people are beginning to see through it. Um, You know, there was just, I just read, um, I mean, certainly the reports from the human rights organizations that Israel is an apartheid state, I think have Mm -hmm. made headway in this. Um, They've been really important. But you also have a new Pew poll that says that that young people um, in the States are are demonstrating more favorable favorable views toward Palestinians than they have in the past. These changes skew young. So older people are still holding on to the very pro-Israel views. But for young people, that's changing. Um, We know that in Canada, from polls, that there is significant sympathy for for Palestine, um, despite the fact that we have a government that consistently supports Israel um, and is really functioning um, in, in opposition in some ways to, to what people in this country think. Um, so that's been really, really difficult. Um, I think that, that you know, the, the reversion to these there have always been the accusations of anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism, um, mm-hmm. but that's really revved up. And I, I, I want to direct your listeners to a really important new book that's been published um, by uh, Anthony Lerman, who is from the UK, called Whatever Happened to Anti-Semitism, Redefinition and the Myth of the Collective Jew, in which he documents 30 years of this new anti-Semitism discourse um, and the, um, you know, the, the efforts made to equate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism and how that's really shifted everything. Um, you know, I think that, that I just think it's, it's, there's a, there's a whiff of desperation um, in some of these new, um, you know, more vicious um, kinds of attacks, more concerted attacks, more attacks that involve the use of the state uh, as a tool. Um, you know, I think that in the States, the the recent um, uh, funding of pro-Israel campaign uh, uh, campaigns of candidates for the midterm elections, you know, was, was absolutely scandalous, but it shows how far pro-Israel forces are willing to go in order to silence that criticism in the public square. So that's, um, you know, and, as, and I, and I really want to um, underline what Rowan was saying about, um, about the use of liberatory language and the, the um, appropriation of these, of these ideas such as, I mean, obviously Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people is an old, oldie, but goodie that's been used for, for years. And you have, of course, the, you know, as Rowan pointed out, um, this notion of indigeneity, Jews as being indigenous uh, to the Middle yeah. East, which which builds on decolonizing discourse here and there, but then you have some something that the the newest one that I've noticed is um, is the appropriation of the disability rights slogan, "Nothing about us without us," which is trying to put forward the notion that um, that Jew, when Jews talk about anti-Semitism, they're telling you the truth. Um, that you have to listen to Jews. Listen to the Jews. I was told once when I was debating somebody from the from the right. Um, so this is all good and well. And I, as I said, I think that claims of anti-Semitism need to be listened to absolutely. Um, but um, you know, the experiences of anti-Semitism among Jews is widely divergent. Depends on how the the individual is positioned. We know that in, for example, in parts of New York. People who are visibly Jewish, mostly the you know, the Haredi or the ultra orthodox, um, have been the victims of a lot of violent attacks. Um, and we need to think very critically about these incidents of anti Semitism and what they mean. And there hasn't been much critical thinking about that. That's why I think Tony Lerman's book is so very important. Um, and of course, there's the growing number of Jews who disagree with equating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So there's a lot, I think, that is prompting the pro-Israel forces to really dig deep and drill down and come out, you know, with, if I may use this term, guns blazing 
um, at those who are criticizing Israel. Jump in. I, I think there's yeah. also a sense, and we've seen this in other countries, in which this kind of fear of gets kicked up around anti-Semitism. The, the most widely known example would probably be the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, but also the National Union of Students there. There's been uh, cases in the US as well. And just undermining, often with flawed or false information around anti-Semitism or false or false accusations, creating this narrative of rampant anti-Semitism and within this narrative, any one person or one incident or one comment can just be have the term anti-Semitic thrown at it. And because it's in this broader narrative, that's taken for granted. And we see attempts to kind of build this with discussions around rampant anti-Semitism on Canadian campuses, discussion of uh, or claims that Jews are the most targeted um, religious minority in Canada. Um, claims that Jewish students are under threat on campus, etc. And it's part of this attempt to create this broader narrative where the kind of individual cases can then be be essentially picked off um, and fit so well into a broader narrative that they don't actually need evidence to say, well, you know, if you, you know, in this thought process, it's like if Canadian universities are have rampant anti-Semitism, then when someone reports this incident of anti-Semitism, you can almost take it for granted. You almost don't need any evidence. Right. And, you know, that's kind of, in broad strokes, what happened within the Labour Party. It's obviously more complicated than that. But I think that we see attempts to construct similar narratives in Canada as well and in other places across the world. But there are efforts to push back, right? There was a response to the IHRA definition published called the Jerusalem Decl Declaration on Anti-Semitism that takes a quite nuanced approach to trying to define this in a usable way that doesn't limit speech. Can you describe efforts to respond to these suppression efforts? Sure. I, I mean, I think the Jerusalem Declaration, which I was actually privileged to work on, um, which was a really wonderful experience, actually, um, it was a valiant, if flawed, effort. Um, I don't think it's accomplished what people wanted it to accomplish for a variety of reasons. Um, it certainly hasn't accomplished the goal of replacing the IHRA, but it's become, become a useful tool in some ways to use. To, number one, I think that the fact that 350 of the most highly regarded Jewish studies and Holocaust scholars in the world signed the JDA is really significant. Unfortunately, I think that the organized, the institutional Jewish community is very anti-intellectual um, and is not, you know, I was, I was reading, I can't, I think it was Peter Beinart had an article where he recently, where he was saying that, you know, rather than thoughtful leaders in the Jewish community, which historically there have been, you now have mega donors running the Jewish community who really have no, you know, regard for what Jewish intellectuals are saying at all. Um, so something like the JDA just gets pushed under the rug. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think it's important to talk about the victories here. And in that regard, Canada has been really, really successful. Um, we, I think our biggest victory, we've, we've managed to keep the IHRA from being adopted in a number of places. Um, and you can check our website, um, to see, you know, the catalog of those. But I think the most important thing that we've accomplished, and it's really critical to emphasize that this was done in coalition with other groups. I think this is really the key to countering yeah. some of this stuff. Um, and that is that we managed to get 40 faculty associations to pass resolutions rejecting the IHRA, uh, adoption of the IHRA on campus. But bigger than that, we managed to get the Canadian Association of University Teachers, which represents 70,000 academic workers, to pass unanimously uh, a, uh, a motion that rejects the adoption of the IHRA. So wow. um, that was a huge, huge victory, um, which was noted internationally. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the key with that was that people saw the ITRA as a threat to academic freedom and, you know, all the other arguments were not, were not relevant, but that was relevant because people really understand the threat of these, of making, for example, you know, these seven out of 11 
examples that Rowan mentioned at the beginning, um, if these were to be applied to academic teaching, to advocacy on campus, it would mean uh, penalties for a lot of people. And I think what, what's important to remember here with the IHRA is that nobody really knows what its legal implications are. That, you know, it's not, it hasn't been tested in any of these places. Um, you know, some of us want to go out and intentionally shout in the streets, Israel's a racist endeavor and see what happens, uh, whether we get arrested or charged or I don't know what. Um, but it, it's much more serious in things like school boards, which, and we have a lot of, there have been a lot of incidents in, in Canada where they're trying to make school boards adopt this so that any teaching around Palestine or any, um, you know, allowing students to protest around Palestine is shut down. So um, we try, I think against huge odds, we have succeeded um, modestly uh, in Canada. Um, and we're just up against a really, you know, difficult uh, opponent here. But there are ways of doing this, and you ha we have to work together with others. I mean, the Jewish, you know, dissident community needs to partner certainly with the with the, you know, Muslim, Arab, Palestinian communities who are affected by these, oh. by the IHRA and other things, um, the academic community, um, the arts community. Um, we've managed to put together coalitions of all these groups that have been able to reach into their constituencies for support. Um, and we've, it's gotten us a modicum of success. And I think it's a, in some ways, it's a model for how this has to be done elsewhere. So what's next for this report? Uh, how can people find it? We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, how can people find your work online and connect? So this report will be uh, available on IJV's website as well as social media. IJV has Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as a newsletter that you can sign up to. Um, in terms of the report itself, I, I think what we really want to do is start a broader conversation around the depths of how this harassment is taking place because there's a lot of writing and there's a lot of publications around uh, outstanding cases or really notable and big cases. Uh, and our hope with this is that we start a conversation beginning with the Canadian context, but we really hope it goes beyond that around the kind of depths that activists are facing, or sorry, the depths of how much harassment is going on and all these stories that you would never normally hear because these people don't have access to um, news sources or anything mm -hmm. like that that can amplify their voices or they're simply too scared to take advantage of the resources that they do have. Um, and so I, I think, you know, sharing this research in other contexts and having kind of other people from other countries engaging with it is something that we're really interested in to see how this is happening in Canada compared to other places. And I think as well, we want to, to push this onto campuses. We want it to be a resource for students and professors who are facing harassment so that, you know, when uh, a student gets attacked for, for, you know, supporting terrorism or whatever, they can, they can pull it to our report and they can say, you know, actually, this is part of a pattern of racist harassment that is being mobilized against me. And things like that is really what we're hoping. And so to do that, we're, we're going to be attempting to push it into university offices, um, EDI offices, student unions, etc. And um, hoping to just spread the word about it more generally, I think. Yeah. Well, super. Rowan, Cheryl, thank you so much for your work on this report and for taking time to join us on the Mondo Wise podcast. Thanks thank for having so much us. For having us and for, for helping share a word about it. Thanks for listening to our show. Visit our site to sign up for free daily and weekly newsletters on Palestine, Israel, and related U.S. politics. If you're enjoying our podcast, please consider becoming a donor by visiting mondoweiss.net slash donate. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication, and every donation of any amount helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find our show.